Hello everyone, my name is Neha and welcome to Dropping Your Armor, where we listen to stories from thinkers, doers and dreamers, all in the hope of unlocking our infinite human potential. This is a very special episode. It's the first of a series that we call Spotlight. If you've tuned in before, you're probably familiar with our established format, where our guests take center stage and we explore the world through their eyes. In addition to doing that, we will now periodically release Spotlight episodes where we aim to shine a light on certain topics together with an expert and explore it through many different lenses, from psychological to economic to business to spiritual and so on. So, to kick off our Spotlight series, we will start by demystifying transformations. In organizational life, this is a pretty popular buzzword by now, and if you stick agile or lean before the word, you take the buzz up to a whole new level. In a previous episode with Jochen Gerzer from Bosch Power Tools, we explored his experience of facilitating organizational transformations, and it was very insightful. Now, we want to dive deeper and discuss the necessary conditions to facilitate both inner personal transformations as well as outer systems transformations. This is a pretty tall order, and I think that calls for a pretty tall expert. And you would find that hilarious if you could see my expert guest, Joachim Stempfle. Joachim is the founder of A-Train, a company with the mission to realize true potential in people, organizations, and society, and which is also the super cool organization where I work. <laughs> Joachim has been helping leaders from many different organizations across multiple industries to lead purpose-driven and human-centric transformations. He's a highly experienced facilitator and coach who keeps a beginner's mind and curiously explores the subject. He's also a very dear colleague whom I and many others call Joe, so please don't get confused if you hear me call him Joe throughout this conversation. This is a two-part episode exploring both inner and personal transformation as well as outer and system transformation. Yes, we love the topic so much that we could not contain it in one part and hence that's why we have two parts. This first part spotlights inner transformation. I hope you enjoy it. Hey Joe, welcome to Dropping Your Armor. I'm so happy that we can get you over here. Hey Neha, how are you? I'm doing great. And Joe, I'm really excited about this. Um, I wanted to talk to you about transformations and, you know, we do a lot of work uh, with different customers on transformations, but we also hear a lot about people talking about their transformation journeys. And I, I feel like this topic is um, shrouded in some mystique, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of talk. It's, it's, it's a hot topic for a lot of people. And I thought we could just take some time to demystify it and see what it actually means why we've been having this conversation right now and just get into it. I love the approach of demystifying. There's a lot of buzzwords around and transformation is one of them. So what are we really talking about, right? Yeah. So let's start with that. Like, what, wh why do you think there's so much, uh, like so many buzzwords around it? Yeah, I would approach it from a different perspective. You know, transformation is the most normal thing in the world and it has always been around. I think we look at it as something new or something special. When you look at what the purpose of business is, it has always been to make the world better, to provide something to service to, to, uh, service to, to society, to customers, to people that people use and need and to continuously improve that. So as you continuously improve um, what you provide, Obviously, you also need to evolve your organization, you need to evolve your skills. So it's, I think it's the most natural and normal thing in the world. And businesses have always transformed. Um, we sometimes tend to think as, yeah, it's something unique, something special, something that's just important now. What is different maybe is the speed of that transformation that we see innovation happening at a faster pace. So transformation doesn't happen in waves anymore, where you might have had periods of longer periods of stability and then periods of transformation, but that ideally it's an ongoing continuous process and organizations that create that illusion of stability basically struggle the most because then they end up, you know, having to make big transformations every couple of years um, while there is this big phase of stability. And, and that makes it so much more difficult to to deal with it. Yeah. And I, and I think that stability, like you told me, right, yesterday, that in, 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 I mean, in, when you look at nature, stability actually means death. So why do we even crave it so much? I think it has to probably do with a little bit of our 
with our evolution, right? That we, um, and, and how our brains were wired, that we seek familiarity, we ste- seek equilibrium, stability, but that's actually not how we grow and develop ourselves. It doesn't happen in nature. It doesn't happen to us. Um, also, it doesn't happen to like financial institutions, right? You, If you look at, um, for a long time, people assumed that financial institutions were very stable, which also bred the instability and led to that financial crash. If you look at the systems behind it, it's it's... It's completely crazy to think that a system or a person or anything can be stable in this world, right? You're so right, right? When you look at nature, as you said, only, only dead things are stable, right? Everything else in nature moves constantly. And I love this this notion that, you know, stability on a macro level often means constant change on a micro level. If you look at the human body, there is constant changes in cells. There is constant exchange of resources so that the body can keep its body temperature. And these, these small changes on a micro level maintain a higher level, you know, kind of stability for our system. I think we look at the same um, process anywhere in society, whether it's an organization, whether it's society as a whole, that there is constantly forces changing that need to be balanced out and finding a new equilibrium. And once once you understand that and you embrace it, also, you know, you just it just becomes the most normal thing in the mm. world. Yeah. And, and you know, um, uh, yesterday I was reading a little bit about, I, I saw this article on, uh, it's very old, like 1948, I think. Um, it's called Science and Complexity. And um, the person who wrote it, he talks about different problems in science uh, that, that science can solve for us, right? So number one on one extremes are like the problems of simplicity, like that include one or two variables where, you know, there's a cause effect, there's linear basically relationship between those two variables, like Newton's laws, right? Like apple falling down from the tree. On the other extreme, you have problems of organi- uh, pr- problems of uh, disordered complexity. So this is on the you know very quantum level. You have a lot of random movement of billions of different variables, and it's essentially chaos, right? You you just, for example, when you look at the behavior of molecules in in gas, it's just completely random. So that's like problems of disordered complexity. And somewhere in that spectrum in the middle lie the problems of organized complexity, right? Where you have a sizable number of variables. It's not one or two, it's quite a few, but not to the extreme. Um, And they're interrelated in some organic connected whole in a complex yet organized system. And I feel like for, I mean, organizations are that, right? You have several actors and organizations. It's not just one person. There are small things that change in an organization that can have large unintended effects and big things that probably have no effects. So it's it's more of this, you know, it's, it's a complex adaptive system. And I feel like a lot of the approaches in the past and even the way we think about stability and transformation tend to think about the problem as a problem of simplicity, right? If you do one thing and if you set the right precedent, make the right, you know, kickoff, everything will go as planned. But it's actually, it's 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 completely natural, but it's also a very, um, it's a systems problem, right? It's not a, you do this and you get this response. You are so right, right? And the question is, what's the metaphor we're using, right? Uh, I think a lot of the traditional management thinking is based essentially on a machine metaphor, right? Which assumes that you can control and predict and plan but whenever you deal with a complex system with multiple actors who all have their own goals, right? Um, once the actors start behaving, no one can predict what will happen because each action causes something else in someone else. So it's essentially an unpredictable ecosystem, right? You're looking at more like an ecosystem and you, we should use metaphors from nature, mm-hmm. right? That explain how, 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 how in nature things evolve as opposed to mechanical paradigms. I think that makes it easier to grasp. But on the why of transformation, you know, there is also a very, I think there's a very human and personal thing that people want to know why are we as an organization transforming and why are we transforming now, right? And what for? I think that's a very legitimate question that leaders will need to be able to answer. And ideally, we answer it all together. And whenever we can tap into what is the ultimate purpose of this organization? Why was it built in the first place? To provide what for whom? Right. Every organization has a soul and a reason to exist. And often you need to even go back to history to see the original founding of the organization. What purpose did it serve? And then you ask the question, you look at with all the technological changes that happen, what could we possibly now bring to our customers? over what we have done in the past, right? How could we much better serve our customers in society? 
that gives you a very powerful why, because then you realize what's possible. You know, like I had a very powerful conversation with a group um, that was talking about strategy and vision and things like that. And and we did talk about those questions. And, and at one point, you know, I raised the question, I said, if you look at all the capabilities that this organization has, and you look at everything you have at your disposal, what is it that you could ultimately achieve, right? What would be your ultimate potential? This was a healthcare company mm -hmm. and it was people very much focused on selling drugs. And they, they then said, you know, essentially we could look at the entire patient journey and we could pe keep people healthy all the way from when they don't even know yet that they have a risk factor, you know, a genetic risk factor, all the way through disease management. We could look at, we have the capabilities um, to tap into that entire pathway. Why are we only looking at selling a drug? You know what yeah. I mean? And that's a powerful question, right? Because it, it, it gets people to realize that they could do so much more for society and for patients. And that's an energy that we need to tap into, I think, in people. The desire to create more value for those who need it rather than we transform just for the sake of financial effectiveness, for example. That is important, right? Organizations need to stay healthy. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, I think profit is important, but it's a means to an end. It's not an end goal. Absolutely. And I and I think you need that sort of emotional, very visceral connection with the purpose in order to even create that movement, right? It, it's not... It's not just, I mean, I, I, pers I personally would not get excited about um, just a number on a sheet of paper that that's my target. I need something more. People, human beings are meaning making beings. And that's also uh, the human side of the transformations, right, that we need to recognize. I think you're so right. And this, this meaning making is so important that people have a narrative and understand why we're doing this and who are we doing it for. And, and then you, you make sense of it and you integrate it with your personal narrative, right? Why are you doing this work? What's getting you up every morning? And when you connect your personal narrative and your personal purpose with the purpose of the organization and the narrative for the transformation, I think that's where you get the intersection of energy, right? And that's why one, one thing I think from our practice that uh, often is, is overlooked is the importance of writing a narrative when you do a transformation, right? We often now, we literally get leaders to write it. In one of the, the, the recent workshops, we literally had them sit down in five stations with different chapters of the narrative, sitting down around a Google sheet, writing down the narrative because, you know, they have made that narrative in their head, right? They have gone through all this process, but a lot of people haven't yet. So telling that story and that narrative and then enabling people to chime in and, and write that narrative for themselves or for the part of the organization they're responsible for, I think is such an important part of any transformation, right? It's uh, Friedrich Nietzsche who said, you know, he who has a why can endure almost any how, right? Mm -hmm. And there's so much truth to that. So wh wh where do you go from there? I mean, that's that's the purpose, right? You have to have that idea of who you are and also a bit of that North Star about where you're going in a way. What's Yeah, exactly, right? And that that's, this is, if you really think about it, right? You have the North Star and this is your, what are you ultimately trying to create and for whom? And then you logically get to a point where you're like, how the hell do we get there, mm -hmm. right? Um, so often the North Star is a big hairy goal that's, far out there somewhere, maybe five years out, 10 years out. So then the whole translation process starts, right? How would we translate that into a strategy? You know, what would be steps that get us there? And in an unpredictable world, increasingly an agile strategy where you might have a more like a, a roadmap and you might have some overarching priorities, but then you have to be very practical and get down to a one year kind of, you know, where do we focus first? You know, what do we need to create first to be, be enabled the next thing? And I think that's a very important part of any transformation that you basically start from purpose and vision and, and, and a big North Star, but then you translate it down. And this whole process of translating it into action is such a great opportunity to involve large amounts of people, right? So the best transformation processes is always human centric transformation processes we engage people's brains and hearts into this and so this whole step moving you know creating that north star but then the strategy behind it is a beautiful opportunity to involve large amounts of people in the organization and ideally obviously also customers and others um, to create that together right and i think one thing that is so important in transformation is people want control over their lives. So no one wants to be controlled by someone else and just told what to do, mm -hmm. right? So if we can give people agency 
in this transformation process. The more we can give people agency, the more ownership we can create, and the more people have an ability to shape what we're trying to create with us, um, the more um, people will not resist because they have created it, right? So a lot of the discussion around resistance and transformation, from my point of view, is an artifact of basically a very small group behind closed doors deciding what's done and then just rolling that over everyone else. That doesn't mean you don't need to have decision makers, yeah. right? There needs to be ultimately some clear decision making authority on whom, who ultimately makes the decision on vision and strategy. And that needs to be defined, but you can engage large amounts of people and you will learn uh, a lot more and you will actually get a much better strategy than if you do it by yourself. And I think we've been part of, you know, you and I have been part of some of those processes where we did engage large amounts of people. And I remember one example where we started with a leadership team with the first discussion on vision and strategy, and then they went out to all their line managers and each line manager was running uh, basically a session with their own team to say, you know, this is our first idea. What ideas do you have, you know, to bring this to life, you know, and what's important to you? And we were expecting, um, basically, maybe we get 100 or 200 ideas. And I remember the call we had with the, with the GM. And he was like, oh, shit. And I said, why? Why?" And he said, oh, what do we do now? I expected 100, 150 ideas. We have 2,000, <laughs> you know, and people were contributing so many ideas and were so passionate. And then we spontaneously organized a workshop with all the line managers. We had 70 people to work through these 2,000 ideas in small groups to sift through them and build the strategy bottom up. And it was such a powerful, beautiful process and such a creative process. And, uh, and in that organization, it allowed the organization from a four year decline in revenues to immediately shift within eight months to a growth path because everyone was gaining hope, energy, strength, and people were seeing the future. Yeah. They were able to co-create it and it created such a high level of energy. That is amazing. And I, I mean, I, I, I so I, that resonates with me so much and I so agree with that because I, I don't just think that involving people makes the strategy great. I think it's even a necessary condition in today's world, right? You don't, in a complex adaptive system, even the leadership team cannot have visibility on everything that is needed or going on and tap into all the needs or all the things that are happening in the organization and the surrounding system. So you actually do need the collective intelligence of the people to help you shape the strategy, exactly. right? So it's not just about the outcome, exactly. but even the process of how you get there is so important. And involving everyone and giving them agency, um, not even giving them agency, right? People have the agency. I think that's also what sets uh, adaptive systems apart, that every individual actor has agency. We just need to recognize and validate that. And that's not what's been happening in many organizations in the more traditional setup so far. Indeed, indeed. And even when you look at it from a pure strategy point of view, you know, the content point of view, people sit in different parts of the system. And depending on where you sit, you see certain things with clarity and other things you only see through a distance, right? From a distance, you don't see them clearly. So if you want to have a clear overall picture, you have to have actors who sit in different parts of the system contribute. Otherwise, your picture will always be skewed, yeah. right? Because you will basically be thinking from whatever resolution and angle you have in the system. And I think that also takes a level of modesty and humility to understand that no matter how smart you are, you will never have a full picture. No one can have a full picture. But the more you represent different parts of the system, and ideally, the more obviously you also represent customers, you know, the users, um, the more accurate your overarching picture will be and the better your strategy will be, right? So people often look so much at benchmarks and, and hard data that they forget, for example, to just talk to the people who work with customers directly. Yeah. You know, they have such an important contribution to make. So maybe less market research and instead, you know, go, go with the people who work with your customers on the field trip. You know, you will learn so much more, yeah. right? And, and we also do a lot of those voices of the system, voices of the customer formats, right? Uh, we've both run a couple of those where we bring in directly people from the front lines, um, customers into a leadership team discussion. And I haven't seen a single case where that hasn't fundamentally changed perceptions and views in the leadership team, simply because there was perspectives contributed that due to their position in the system, they could not see. Yeah. And actually, as you mentioned the voice of the system, I also uh, just recalled uh, when we did that last and with together, um, it wasn't just the value that uh, the leadership team got in that situation, right? The people who were in invited from all around the organization, individual contributors, when they came in, they saw that, that setup 
And I heard later on that they started doing mini voices of the system with their customers, with their teams all around the organization. And for them, and I, when I had a check-in with uh, the transformation office a little while later, that one small little action had a much bigger impact in showing the level of empowerment and customer centricity that the, the leadership team had been talking about in the fancy kickoffs and everything, right? There, that, exactly. that intention and communication exactly. was always there. But that little action of doing the voices of the system had a multiplicatory effect on the whole system itself. Yeah, and that's an interesting one. Why is that, right? Because experiences, direct experiences and emotions are so much more powerful than abstract conceptual reasoning, right? If people see something, feel something, touch something, or talk to someone, it has such a different impact, right? It's also why in another organization, we bring in a lot of the, the patient voice, right, in the healthcare organization. And whenever you bring in a patient live to speak about their journey, it has such a different impact than if you look at an abstract patient journey, right? For people to hear from a real human being, it just, just touches you on a different level and it creates a different desire to help even more, right? So I, I think this is a great example that you just shared, right? When one, one, one example of having a voice of a customer or a patient can, can have a much power, more powerful impact than tons of data. And that doesn't mean data is unimportant. You need to make rational decisions as well, but we probably tend to overemphasize these pieces. And uh, yeah, I'm curious also now, uh, how, how do you define essentially transformation, Neha? What is it for you? Like we talked a lot about the why, right? And we talked <laughs> philosophically, but, but and that's a question that I got, you know, in, in, on LinkedIn um, that, that customers ask, what, what, is, what is the transformation and how do you know that whether you're transforming? Huh, it's a very good question. And for me, I mean, put simply, a transformation is development. It's, it's, it's change. But I, have, I feel like there's a positive con connotation to it, right? It's change uh, towards a certain purpose uh, that you have. And it's, it's on multiple levels, right? You have, you have transformations that happen on a, on a personal level, how uh, people uh, develop and grow their mindsets, their, their thinking, how, who, uh, even getting to know themselves on a deeper level, um, also on a systems level, on organizations level, of course. But for me, I think the fundamental thing is positive change towards a purpose. What about you? How do I you agree. see it? I see it exactly the same way, right? I was reflecting on this and for me, it's, it's purposeful change um, to achieve better outcomes, mm. right? For those you are serving ultimately, right? Yeah. And, and that includes all the stakeholders. It includes customers. It ultimately also includes uh, employees. It includes society, right? So from my point of view, yeah, there, there has to be a certain level of balance in this, that the transformation serves multiple stakeholders for the better. It creates better outcomes. Absolutely. And, and then I, I was thinking, you know, these different paradigms towards transformation, right? Um, what What is the best approach to it? Right? That's the million dollar question, mm. <laughs> and, right? What, what's the best approach to transform? And I think a lot of organizations, we see the traditional restructuring approach, right? Transformation means we change the structure. Um, we tend to think about it a little bit differently. Um, and I know you have done a lot of work in that space. So, so what, what are some of the key elements, you know, based on our work, what would say, what makes a good transformation? Mm. I think the first one that I feel is really important is um, that it's a journey, right? It's not, it's not a light switch that you can switch on and off and have a change, but it's actually a journey, a movement, over time with people and that's that's a really really important one for me yeah and that's interesting right a journey means it has steps and 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 it happens gradually organically over time and i like when you say movement because it means it inspires more and more people to join right to help to support so it's essentially a, a, an organic process that attracts people to help and to join, which gives us a good yardstick to say, you know, are we transforming or not? If 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 no one joins, uh, and uh, and it's a one-off, it's probably not a transformation, yeah. right? Um, so I think that's a very important piece. And in fact, I'm, I find it fascinating, you know, when you look at some of the research on what really works in transformation, it's so counterintuitive sometimes to what you read in management literature. For example, um, that um, indeed the more 
a transformation is also open-ended. It does have a North Star, but not everything is this defined. You know, there is openness to basically adapt the direction. The more successful it is, the more people actually carry the transformation in terms of actually have ownership for some piece and can carve out ownership for themselves. Yeah. The more successful it is, the more it allows people to learn and fail throughout, as opposed to have the expectation immediately that everything works, the more successful it is, right? So I find it interesting from that point of view that we've developed also more an approach that says, first have the North Star, build trust in communities and teams, talk about it. Um, and also, you know, this inner transformation, help people to unlearn some things, to get comfortable with different things, then allow people to experiment and build skills and support them and build capabilities. And, and you know, don't change the operating model and the structure too quickly Right. That that's better to it's better to change that when people have already reached a different level of maturity and are already anyways working in different ways. And then in a, in a way, you just change the operating model and the structure is just part of that more as, a, as an outcome, because it's it's kind of the normal thing to do at this point in time, rather than you start from there, yeah. right? It's a different sequence. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you change the operating model first, right, you'll be changing it based on your view of the world at this point in time. But what we're saying is that if you actually grow yourself and, and you know, it's that you've gone through your inner transformation, you're actually open to more possibilities and you can think in also different ways, right? It's like, it's the same uh, parable of a fish in, in water doesn't actually know it's in water, right? When it's, if you, all you've seen is one thing, then you also create exactly. uh, for, an, you create an environment that you're familiar with. So you, in order to have a very good, design of an organization in the future, an operating model that really works, you also need to challenge your own assumptions and think differently in the first place, right? Exactly. And giving people the opportunity to experiment and come to this point themselves is so beautiful. I, I, I was just, uh, I, I had a, a really powerful experience recently working with a, with a fairly new cross-functional leadership team that actually has a pretty big responsibility for an entire, you know, business unit. And uh, people were coming together, you know, kind of as a new team, some not very confident initially, and there was varying degrees of knowledge and experience with different ways of working. And, you know, specifically in this organization, we were looking at bringing in some agile methodologies, for example, OKRs, right, objectives and key results to break down a long-term vision and strategy into very tangible, you know, team goals to basically give a framework that then teams could work with. And I remember the first session we had, you know, there was people in that room who, after we built a lot of trust, basically started to admit and said, I have no clue what you're talking about when you're talking about OKRs and why would we use it? They were used to MBO, traditional paradigms, individual objectives, they're private, right? This is what you agree with your line manager. There's no connection to strategy. And this whole OKR thing for them was just really new, you know, and we had some conversation around the need to bridge strategy with team goals and team objectives and the, the need to move away from individual goals towards meaningful team objectives that tie into a bigger goal but people couldn't get their arms around it and then we gave some space in between and there was actually a team formed out of this group a sub team three or four people who said we want to crack this and one of the people who had no clue joined this team and said i want to join this i want to learn about this and see if it makes sense for us and then we had a follow-up workshop and this group had worked out an approach how to use OKRs in the organization, basically to create goal alignment mm -hmm. with the teams. And this guy was presenting, you know, this was the <laughs> same person who three months before had said, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And here he's presenting confidently about OKRs and presented a proposal that they had created. And the leader came to me while he was presenting his, and he had almost tears in his eyes. He said, isn't this unbelievable to see this growth in people? And this was a three month period, you yeah. know what I mean? And imagine what difference that makes, you know, if, if you label that person as you're resisting and you don't get it, you know, and you try to force something down their throats, you get nowhere. But just giving this co-creation period and this learning period and letting them work out the approach made all the difference in the world. Yeah. I just found that a very inspiring experience, you know, and, and I think it, it so shows that change is always possible if you allow the space, but you do provide obviously a framework for it. But it's so important to allow that space. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, and it also speaks to the interconnectedness again, right? Like you can you can spend a lot of time uh, developing yourself and thinking about your mindset and growing, but sometimes what you might need is a little bit of exposure to something new to just completely shift absolutely. you. And and 
that's that's the kind of those are the kind of moments that also yeah help us grow but also help us shape the system around us you're so right right and the question is what are the conditions we need to create so that people are open for this for this impulse right and, and don't reject it mm -hmm. right that it actually lands on fertile ground that people work with it so you know we talk about this often right in terms of inner transformation that needs to happen in sync with an outer transformation outer transformation more vision strategy operating model right and inner transformation change of your mindset evolution growth uh, how would you define inner transformation and what yeah from your experience what what's what's important ah i was going to actually <laughs> I was going to ask you the same question. <laughs> I was, I was faster. So you were you need faster. To ask the first. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So for me, inner transformation starts by knowing who you are. I think there is fundamentally, you need to understand who you are. And a lot of us, I mean, uh, I for a long time was walking through life without having much awareness of what I do and why I actually do what I do, right? To understand my patterns and my behavior on a deeper level and what actually makes me me. And then from there to also show more compassion and, and acceptance for who you are and think about how how you how how you can contribute and yeah how you can have a positive impact on the world around you i think that journey of from understanding yourself to accepting yourself to to living with integrity and values for me that's inner transformation i i think you, you you're saying some very important things right this self understanding and self acceptance is is key and then you can you can evolve right then you can ask yourself what do you put who and what do you want to put yourself in service of, right? And and that that's a that's a natural evolution. I, I think another way to look at it is, and you know, we've used a lot of psychotherapy research, neuropsychology and psychotherapy research to help inform our approach, right? Is this idea of the inner operating system that humans evolve in conjunction with the experiences they have in the environment that they operate in, right? So, for example, when you experience threats, like a lot of leaders have experienced challenging situations early in life, loss of a parent, um, you know, rejection in school, things like that, right? And then you form ways to deal with it, survival strategies, coping strategies, right? So you, you might become very introverted person then who, who reads a lot, right? Uh, because you're rejected socially. So, you know, I just had an example in, in a session very recently where someone was sharing that, you know, he was basically um, growing up in a very tough environment in an inner city school and ended up withdrawing to the library and, and reading because, you know, he didn't want to get beat up every day. Now that creates skills, right? Because through reading a lot, this person became extremely smart, mm -hmm. right? And became extremely skilled. And with that started to use these strengths um, of, uh, of intelligence to actually become a scientist and become very successful in, in what he was doing. But with that, you know, strength also comes maybe a certain limitation, for example, um, a fear of opening up to other people or asking for help, you know, what I mean, um, that, that that kind of experience of rejection might still be in your system, right? It is still in the system, neurally, it's still in your system. So you might still be afraid to reach out to people you know, um, openly. So, so then this growth journey might entail this inner transformation that you realize who you are and what you bring to the table, that you're leveraging your strength for a purpose, right? Um, but you might also overcome some of your inner hurdles and limitations to reach out to people. Often our brain doesn't yet recognize that we're not the same person that we were 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? So from that point of view, I think it's also understanding your self-protective behaviors that are ultimately not serving any other purpose that, but to keep you safe and to, let's say, transcend and evolve those so that you can fully leverage your strengths um, for a bigger purpose, right? And I think that's, it's beautiful to see when, when we work with people often, this inner transformation leads to awareness, but then eventually also acceptance and confidence and ultimately inner freedom and choice, right? That people feel less compelled to do certain things and more free to choose what they want to do and this allows for example much more open conversations because people don't hold back they're not afraid anymore of if i say this what will happen to me right they realize this might just be a fear pattern mm -hmm. that that might limit them and they might just speak up and say the truth 
because it's important to them or they can start to let go. Um, often very important when you look at more empowering organizational setups, people might recognize a desire to control because ultimately that's what keeps them safe. They want to know the answers. They want to know, they want to be able to control the shots and realizing that ultimately this is just a self-protective behavior. It's not serving the organization, not serving the people. And once you realize that it gives you the freedom to choose to say, do I want to do this or not? Mm. Right. And so I think this inner transformation, which we emphasize so much in many ways is a prerequisite for the outer yeah. transformation. I love that. I love that that it's having the freedom or recognizing your freedom to choose. I really like that exactly. summary. Yeah. So exactly. And, and there's a beautiful uh, quote by, by Viktor Frankl, right? Um, which I saw one of our colleagues has put into um, yeah, a concept that we use who basically says the difference between animals and humans is animals basically have nothing in between the trigger and the reaction. Mm -hmm. As humans, we have that split second of choice. You know, yeah. there is there is something triggering us. We as humans have that split second of choosing how we want to respond. Now, granted, we're not always able to do that because when we're stressed, when we're overwhelmed, we might just end up coming out of our autopilots. But our humanness, our unique humanness is this split second of choice, right? We can choose to do not what's comfortable, what, what's easy, what's safe. We can choose to do what's right. Yeah. And how do we create the conditions where people make these choices more consciously, more deliberately, um, and more freely, right? Um, I think that's that's ultimately what inner transformation is all about. And then there is a skill piece to it as well, right? Just wanting to empower people doesn't mean you know how to do it well, exactly. right? Often then pe people, when they want to empower, for example, they end up giving too much, no guardrails whatsoever, right? And, and then people feel lost and scared and don't have the skills yet. So obviously there is a skill piece to it, but I think this, the, the main thing is really this, this freedom of choice and utilizing that split second between the situational trigger and your response to choose wisely and consciously. If you're enjoying the conversation so far and you're curious about outer systems transformations and the ways in which organizations can evolve their culture, structure and processes, go ahead and click on to part two and enjoy the rest. Mm -hmm.